You know, one thing we are highly blessed with here at Parkside Baptist Church is the music ability that God has given so many different singers. Uh, from uh, the duets that we have that you heard just a moment ago to the soloist that was right before that to many ensembles and many groups. I know we have, I think, five choirs uh, in different variational groups from the, the, the primary to the juniors to uh, the teenagers to the college to uh, the adult to our bus ministry choir. And so uh, God has richly blessed us with that. And then uh, God has given us some good pianists, too, that can actually play. If I was to get over there, it would be thump, thump, flug. And, uh, but they get over there, and they do such a tremendous job, and we thank the Lord for that. And the neat thing about uh, what is happening here is there's always room for people to serve Christ. I mean, so many different areas. I, I know the other day, uh, Brother Ginger, I, and his family went out to eat and uh, just praying about uh, where uh, the Lord would lead them to be able to plug in. And, and as I begin to think about all the different ministries that we have here at our church for people to be able to serve Christ, I know right now we have about six other uh, church services going on on property uh, where the Word of God is being preached and people are being helped and so many different ways to be able to help and to love people. It's such a marvelous place to plug in and serve. Let's notice this, if you will, Romans chapter 4, verses 23 down through verse 25. The Bible says, now it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him. But notice this, the Bible says, but for us also, to whom uh, it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now it doesn't stop there. The Bible says in verse 25, it says, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And so today is a day, as you and I well know, that uh, we come to church as people all over America and in many different parts of the world on their Sunday, they come to church to celebrate our risen Lord. Now, can I tell you, if he be not risen, you and I are sitting here in vain. If he be not risen, why in the world would we spend so much time as over 200 soul winners go out every single week of the world to knock on doors, to tell people about Jesus, to pass out gospel tracts? Why would we be uh, spending so much money and sending missionaries to a foreign field? Why would we be running nine buses uh, in the Dallas metro to be able to reach into uh, homes that are less fortunate than most people that are sitting in this auditorium this morning? Why is it that we would do that if Jesus be not risen. Now, can I tell you, because he is risen, that's why we do what we do. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Now, can I tell you, his name needs to be proclaimed everywhere. We don't need to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We need to take the gospel of Christ everywhere we go. You think about why God created you. God created you to have fellowship with him and to be obedient to him. One of the ways that we can be obedient to Christ is to make sure that those that are lost die with uh, hearing the gospel of Christ. Everybody deserves to hear the gospel of Christ before they die. Everybody deserves that, whether that be your friend or whether that be your neighbor, whether that be somebody that lives around you or in a neighborhood far distant from you or somebody on the other side of the world, everybody deserves the right to hear the gospel. May I tell you that on the day of our resurrected Lord, there were those that were chanting, probably hoping and wishing that he would not raise again, but yet he did. He raised victoriously over sin, death, and the devil. And because of that, you and I can have victory in Christ today. So I'd like to speak this morning on the message left in the tomb. The message left in the tomb. Uh, a message was, of course, uh, put on a tombstone one day, and it was put on the tombstone of Mr. Solomon Pease. It read this, uh, this ain't peas, it's just as pod. P shelled out and went to God. Now, can I tell you, that's the way it ought to be in every person's life. And so you and I are, are simply uh, housed in that which is our physical body. You uh, are a soul that has a body. 
Your soul is going to continue to live somewhere. You ought to make sure that you have a clear understanding of the gospel and a clear understanding of your need of Jesus Christ, but not just understand those matters. Understand not just your need and not just the clarification of that need, but understand that Jesus Christ is the only one that can forgive your sin and you be able to go to heaven. Understand where the Bible teaches and Jesus is speaking in John 14 and verse 6 where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There's not two ways to heaven, as I've often said, three, four, or five. There's only one way to heaven, and Jesus emphatically says, I am the way. Understand, the Bible says, he that hath the Son hath everlasting life. Now, that doesn't complicate your understanding. Matter of fact, that makes your understanding very simple. You either have him or you don't. He that hath the Son hath everlasting life. It did not say he that hath the Son and is baptized. If you're trusting Jesus Christ and baptism this morning, I, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. I really am sorry to have to tell you this and to break it to you, uh, but you're not going to get to heaven. You're not going to get to heaven because baptism saves no man. The Bible says, for by uh, uh, works of righteousness, which we have done. Now, wait a minute. What is it talking about? Well, it talks about, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works of righteousness, Amen. which we have done. Let's leave it in context, okay? Yeah. So I cannot be able to go to heaven because of the works of righteousness that I have done. It doesn't matter if the work of righteousness that I have done is that which comes in the form of baptism or that which is a work of righteousness which I have done is because I'm an usher somewhere in a church or a work of righteousness that I have done is because I play a piano or I play an instrument in an orchestra someplace in a religious gathering. It doesn't matter if the work of righteousness which I have done is because I'm a deacon in a church somewhere, a Sunday school teacher in a a church somewhere, a preacher that stands behind a pulpit somewhere, somebody that passes out gospel tracts, or even, yes, goes to a mission field. No, it's for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works which we have done. All right? And so we understand this. We understand that a person does not get saved by works. We get saved by that which is the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus didn't die so that bad people could be made good. Jesus died so that dead people could be made alive. And we can be made alive in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that we were dead in trespasses and sin. The only way you could ever become resurrected is resurrected in Jesus Christ. The only way you could ever be able to go to heaven is because Christ liveth in in you. And so when you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, He's the one that washes away your sin. He's the one that gives you eternal life. He's the one that uh, makes sure that your name is written in the book of life and sealed onto the day of redemption, the gathering of the saints. Now, if you don't know that as a dear friend, I would like to tell you, you can know that. If you don't understand that, I can tell you, you can understand that. And if you've not yet received Christ as Savior, can I tell you, it's imperative that you receive Christ as Savior. Many years ago, it was on February the 27th, 1991, uh, it was in Iraq. It was during the time of the war, and a woman by the name of Ruth uh, Delwell, Ruth Delwell, received a message. It was one of the worst messages that a mom could ever receive. But uh, it was a message about her son by the name of Clayton Carpenter. Clayton Carpenter, of course, was a private first class. He stepped on a landmine in the Persian Gulf, and she received the message that no mother wants to receive that her, uh, that her son was now dead. She, she just grieved. I mean, she grieved and grieved and grieved, and it's a true story, and as she grieved and grieved and grieved, she grieved for three days. I mean, she just grieved for three days, and all of a sudden, the phone rang. And when the phone rang, there was a familiar voice on the other end of the phone, and it said this, Mom, I'm not dead, I'm alive. Now, can I tell you, that's a true story, and it was three days, and all of a sudden that son called just to let Mama know, I'm not the one that stepped on the landmine, and I'm A-OK. -okay. Well, can I tell you, Jesus Christ is a risen Lord today, and He is A-OK. -okay. 
decay. Can I tell you this morning that uh, uh, in the tomb, when you would step into the tomb, you would see the clothes and you would see the napkin and uh, 75 pounds worth of spice. And by the way, the tomb was found with no body, no body, no body. There was no body that was found in the tomb. And can I tell you, because he lives today, you and I can have victory in our life. Uh, uh, the four uh, most uh, important words that you'll find in the book of Matthew is Matthew chapter 28 and verse 6, where the Bible says, he is not here. He is not here. And can I tell you, that is what our resurrection day is all about. Now, what do you get when all of a sudden you understand that we serve a risen Lord? What is it that you get when you receive Jesus Christ as Savior? Is there benefits that you get when you receive Christ as your personal Savior? Yes, there is. I want to give you four of them. Uh, in the tomb that you see uh, that is empty, in the tomb that you see uh, that there are some things left in the tomb, what do you see? Well, here's what you see because Jesus is no longer in the tomb. There's a message left. Uh, statement number one, there's the message of pardon. There's the message of pardon. If Jesus be not risen, you and I cannot be pardoned. But because Jesus Christ is risen, you and I have a pardon in Jesus Christ. Uh, the book of Romans chapter uh, 4 and verse 25, the Bible says, was delivered, it says, for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now, what is that? Uh, that means that there is proof that the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made was acceptable in the sight of God. It's through him that we have justification. It's through him that we are pardoned. It's through him that we can be able to step out. And by the way, even when you're having a bad day, you should be able to look back at your life and say, thank God I'm saved. Amen. Because if you're having a bad day, I don't care if somebody put too much sugar in your coffee this morning, and I don't care if somebody didn't put any sugar in your coffee this morning, or I don't even care if your wife gave you no sugar this morning. Can I tell you, you ought to thank God that Jesus Christ is risen. All right, here's what we understand. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, the Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. All right, so when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's the message of pardon. Uh, can I tell you, Jesus Christ in his death made provision as he, yes, even called unto God the Father as he was getting ready to lay down his life as a total sacrifice. And he said this, Father, forgive them. Yes. Father, forgive them. Now, by the way, he did not hold you in account for that which was his death. He laid down his life for you and I. He laid down his life for you and I so that through his life uh, we might have eternal life because of the fact he did not stay dead. And by the way, you show me somebody else that uh, was raised from the dead that is the only begotten of the Father and you could have another Savior. But you cannot show me that. Nor could anybody else show me that. There's only one begotten of the Father, that is Jesus Christ, the righteous. That's why we're excited about running buses. And that's why we're excited about teaching the Bible in Sunday school. And that's why we're excited about having a Christian academy. That's why we're excited about training young men and ladies to go out uh, to the mission field and uh, to the regions beyond. And yes, even here in the United States through our Bible college training. Why? Because the message of pardon is real. It's real because of his death, but it's also real because of his deliverance. There was two uh, presidents that held office here in the United States that offered pardons. One of them was President Lincoln. President Lincoln uh, heard of a young man uh, that had fallen asleep. He was the sixth of uh, uh, six siblings in that family, but he was the sixth one uh, there that was born. He was the youngest one that was born, and uh, he was just a young man, 18 years of age, and he was on duty that night, and he was supposed to guard his post, and he fell asleep at the post. Well, back in those days during the Civil War, if you fell asleep at your post, it was automatic execution. 
automatic. Uh, you know, they would put you before a firing squad and they would fire and they would take your life immediately. You would be shot as an example of how important your post was supposed to be. Uh, the, uh, the, the history books tells us that Abraham Lincoln heard about this child. Uh, four of the children had already been killed and uh, there was only one that was living and he had been just injured and now this was the sixth child. The dad had written Abraham Lincoln and uh, quickly uh, was the response is, of course, uh, they did not do the executions immediately. There was a trial, and of course, uh, then the person was to be executed. But uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, sent an immediate summons. Matter of fact, it got there early that morning. The men had already lined up. The young man was put against the brick wall. Uh, the uh, muskets were pointed at him. They were getting ready to fire, and all of a sudden, the paper of deliverance was delivered, and a pardon was given from the president of the United States. Th that is the highest ranking office in the United States of America and the only one that could give a pardon. Can I tell you, there is an office greater than the President of the United States and only through his office could you have that which is a complete pardon and that is through God. And only through Jesus Christ can we have that pardon because he is the one that has delivered that freedom from uh, to us. And so, Brother John, if you would stand and if this was a, a Bible track that gave the truth right here and I was to go up to him and I want to be able to be the one that would deliver the truth to tell him how he could be pardoned. Now, by the way, I can't pardon him. I cannot forgive him. I cannot walk in that which is the stead of God nor take the place of Jesus Christ. Nobody has the power to save, save Jesus Christ only. But I can be the delivery boy. I can be the messenger boy. I can go over and tell him the good news that Jesus Christ does save. And our church is all about that. And so I go over and I tell him about Jesus Christ. Now he has the right to be able to receive a gift, a gift that would give him a passage to heaven. What is that gift? That gift is eternal life. When he receives eternal life through Jesus Christ, Again, he that hath the Son hath everlasting life. Everlasting life is not in a person other than the person of Jesus Christ. Everlasting life is not in some religious type of theology or practicality. Everlasting life is in the Savior. And so if I was to give him uh, the gospel truth, he would have that which is he could receive or he could reject. That would be totally up to him. So is it with the gift of God. The gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Upon giving him that which is eternal life that God the Father gives through his Son, Jesus Christ, he either will receive it or he will reject it. Now that would be totally up to his call. God forces himself, God forces his Son on no one. And so it has to be the will of man. That's why the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, can I tell you, the Bible teaches that hell was not prepared for you and I. The Bible says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. The Bible says that God's not willing, listen to it, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is not God's will this morning that you attend the service at Parkside Baptist Church and leave here and die and burn in hell one day. That is not God's will. Hell was not prepared for you. When God prepared, prepared hell, He prepared it for the devil and his angels. He did not have you in mind. And He even says what His will is. His will is that you not perish. His will is that you not burn in hell. But his will is that you would come to Jesus Christ. He even says now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. He even tells you when to get saved. Thank you. Be seated. I understand this. I understand that God in the tomb leaves a message. He leaves a message through his son. His son that has left. Well, what's the message, preacher? That's exactly it. His son which has left. Because his son has left, there's the message of pardon. Woodrow Wilson was the other president that gave a pardon. He gave a pardon to somebody that was on death row, and that person rejected the pardon. 
So you can either accept the pardon or reject the pardon. It's really up to you. You can decide whether you're going to be that one this morning that says yes to Jesus Christ, or you can decide this morning that you're going to be that person that says no to Jesus Christ. But the pardon is there. We can receive it or we can reject it. Now, wait a minute. What is the message that was left in the tomb? Pardon. What is the message that was left in the tomb? Peace. Peace. The Bible talks about how through God and His Son, Jesus Christ, we can have peace. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 20 and verse 19, the Bible says in the same day, being the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, peace be unto you. By the way, just the word peace sounds peaceful. It almost sounds like the word fresh. When you get a fresh drink of water, when you get a fresh taste of an orange or something like that, can I tell you worry is the opposite of peace? Can I tell you worry is looking at God through your problems? But can I tell you that peace is looking at your problems through God? We can have peace with God. How do we have peace? Peace with God. John chapter 20 and verse 21, the Bible says, And Jesus saith unto them again, uh, Peace be unto you, as the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So how is it that we can have peace with God? We can have peace with God by being that one that receives Jesus Christ as Savior. We can be that one by being busy about, uh, as a child of God, delivering that peace to other people. Hey, can you imagine this? Uh, that the bathtub was invented in 1850. 1850. Now, wait a minute. The, the telephone was not, or the, the phone, the telephone was not invented till 1875. So for 25 years, people were able to sit in the bathtub with perfect peace. Then all of a sudden, the telephone was invented in 1875, and that interrupted peace for the rest of man's life. Now, can I tell you, God wants you to have that peace. Uh, there's enemies of peace. Greed is an enemy of peace. Uh, that which is uh, somebody that has a high ambition sometimes is an enemy of peace. Sometimes envy is an enemy of peace. Sometimes anger is an enemy of peace. Sometimes pride, where man is overtaken by pride, is a very enemy of peace. Now, what do you find in the tomb? I mean, Jesus has gone out of the tomb. So what is it that I gain by Jesus resurrecting out of the tomb? I get the message of pardon. I get the message of peace. I get the message of purity. The message of purity. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible says, uh, Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Christ. The Bible says in verse 9, the Bible says, Knowing that Christ, uh, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Listen to it. For it says, uh, In that he died, he died unto sin once. And the Bible says, But he that liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, wait a minute. How is it that I can have a peace or a deliverance from that which is the stain of sin? What do I do? I understand this, that I, I have to understand that God is the one that through God, you and I can have deliverance of sin. We don't have to live in sin any longer. Now, by the way, uh, Ken, uh, you're never going to be sinless. You're, you're, you're a human being. You're never going to be sinless. You said, well, when I married her, I thought she was sinless. You found out different since then. When I married him, I thought he was sinless. You found out different since then. When I had my children, I thought they were sinless. You found out different since then. Now, you can't be sinless, but you can sin less. And God wants us to sin less. Now, can I tell you, how do we do that? Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 12, the Bible says, let not sin. Let not sin. That's a choice. Let not sin. Let not sin, therefore reign in your mortal uh, body, it says, uh, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So you have a choice whether you're going to commit that which is sin or not. 
You have a choice whether you're going to step into something or not. Statement number one, uh, because he has now left us something in the tomb. What did he leave us in the tomb? We know this. We know that he did not leave himself. We know that God raised him from the dead. We know that he sits on the right hand of God the Father today. We know that because he's our risen Lord, you can have victory in your life. How can you have victory in your life? You can have pardon in your life. You can have peace in your life. You can have purity in your life. You can have the power of God in your life. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says, uh, which he wrought in Christ. It says when he raised him, stay with it now, he raised him from the dead. That's what we're talking about this morning. He raised him from the dead. He set him, it says, on his own right hand in uh, heavenly places. And so because uh, Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God in heavenly places, you and I can have the power of God because it's Christ that liveth inside of us. Can I tell you this morning, the Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20 where the Bible says that he wrought in Christ. It says when he raised him from the dead that he set him on his own right hand in heavenly places. There's something about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Father that should give you comfort. Many years ago, there was a, a, a very, very renowned uh, 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 conductor, and uh, it, her, uh, his name was Rachel, Rachel, and Rachel was a, a famous conductor. One day, he was conduct, conducting the Messiah, a very well-known piece, and it, it came down to the point where the soloist was supposed to uh, sing this particular part, where the soloist was supposed to sing, I know my Redeemer liveth. Well, he heard the soul. And this, by the way, he's conducting this massive auditorium, uh, thousands of people that are there. And so he is conducting this, and, and she sang it, but she did not sing it just right. And he said, stop, stop, stop. I mean, the conductor had the right to stop it all. He said, stop it. And he stopped them all. He told that one that was singing the soloist, come with me. He took her beside the curtain and said, do you really believe that your uh, Redeemer liveth? And she said, yes. Why don't you sing it like you believe it? And she said, because he's not my Redeemer. He said, let's take care of that right now. Everybody else is just sitting out there. They're waiting to hear this. And he uh, took time to show that young lady that was the soloist that was singing the Messiah in, in that filled uh, Colosseum area. Thousands of people waiting there. And that conductor took his time to go over uh, how that young lady that was singing that part of the solo uh, part in that particular piece showed her her need of Christ. She bowed her head, received Christ, and then he said, now you get out there and you sing that like you should sing that because now your Redeemer liveth. I think sometimes the reason that people don't act like Christians, can I tell you, dear friend, is because they do not have a personal Redeemer. I think sometimes we get our Bibles and we come to church and we've got the pretense on. We've got uh, uh, the traditional walk down. We've got everything down that we know that we should have down. And we fit right in. And because we fit right in, we hit a certain comfort level. I mean, after all, church is church. I mean, after all, we know how to act in church. We know how to smile when the preacher says something that's funny, and we even know how to bring a tear-jerking response when the preacher said something that's sad. We know when to go to the altar. We know where the hymn book is found. We know when to open it up. We know when to sing. We know when to smile. We know when to shake the hands with the brothers, quote-unquote, and the sisters, quote-unquote, that's in the church. But really, are we redeemed? Have we ever truly been redeemed? Can I tell you, dear friend, if, if we are truly redeemed, shouldn't church mean a lot to us? Amen. I mean, who else is going to save you from hell? Right. Who else is going to write your name in the book of life? Amen. The only institution, I submit it to you this morning, but the only institution that Jesus Christ uh, uh, did uh, start in his lifetime was what we call the church. Amen. That's the only institution. There was no other institution that he started. By the way, he didn't start the institution of your job, and he didn't start the institution of your neighborhood. Uh, he started the institution of the local church. 
And by the way, if he started the institution of the local church and he shed his blood and the Bible talks about that he gave his life for the church, then what I tell you and I submit to you this morning, then the local church needs to be important in your life. Amen. You say, oh, preacher, it's Easter and you got me here and, and uh, you ought to feel blessed that I'm here. Can I tell you, dear friend, uh, you ought to feel blessed that you're here. But you could feel more blessed if you come back on a Sunday night. Yes, sir. You could feel more blessed if you showed up on a Wednesday night. Uh-huh. You could feel more blessed if you showed up next Sunday morning. You say, but preacher, you got me here. Now you're scalding me. Well, if I got you here just for one Sunday, bless God, let me have my shot. Now, I'm saying this. I'm saying, look, hey, let's stop playing church. Hey, uh, what happened to Christianity the way Christianity used to be? If somebody saved your life, I'm talking about your physical life, friend. If somebody saved your life, wouldn't you be grateful to them the rest of the days of your life? Wouldn't you be grateful to them because they saved your life and now you get to spend time with your children? They saved your life, and because they did that, now you get to spend time with your grandkids. Now, I want you to think of it, friend. Because Jesus Christ died, and he shed his blood for you, you don't just have life. If you receive Christ as your Savior, you've got eternal life. And if the only thing that our Lord has required out of us as believers is that we be faithful to him, that's not hard. That's not difficult. By the way, he's not asking to live at church. Thank God for that. We don't have room for you. We don't have showers here. If you lived at church, it would be a stinky mess. But can I tell you, uh, he does want us to be faithful. Now, being faithful doesn't make you go to heaven. Jesus Christ is the one when you receive him as Savior. Hey, now you can go to heaven, not because you're good, not because you're baptized, not because you go to church, not because you keep the Ten Commandments, not because you keep the seven sacraments, not because you put so much money in the offering plate, but it's Christ and Christ alone. But can I tell you that after a person gets saved, uh, we ought to act like Christians. Uh, we don't uh, become sinless, but we ought to sin less. Uh, we ought to let God's power work in us and know the Redeemer as that young lady came to know the Redeemer on a personal basis and not just sing about the Redeemer. Now, I love you as your preacher, but can I tell you, are you sure you're saved? Are you sure you're saved? Are you sure uh, that you're just not singing about the Redeemer, but He's not your Redeemer? I'd hate for the rapture to take place today. Today. I'd hate for the rapture to take place today. And you look around and you're the only one that's sitting in your pew. Because you have been left behind. I'm saying this. I'm saying there was a message that was left in the tomb. A message of pardon. A message, a message of peace, a message of purity, a message of power. Let me give you this, and I'm done. A message of position. Listen to it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, but God, who is uh, rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. The Bible says, even when we were dead in sins, hath Quicken us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. It's by the good grace of God that you and I are saved. Well, preacher, I'm such a good person. No, you're not. Amen. Bible says that your righteousness is as filthy rags. That tells you what God thinks about your righteousness. So it's not your righteousness that helps you to merit heaven. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 6, the Bible says, He hath risen us together. It says, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. So the Bible teaches that through Christ, we can have that which is forgiveness of sin. Let me give you a closing illustration. One day, a little boy decided that he wanted to go and be able to see the King's Garden in England. They say it's one of the most marvelous gardens you've ever seen in your life. And so this little bitty boy, age of 12, said, I want to see the king's garden in England. He was not from England, but he was visiting there from another country. And he went up to the guard, and he thought just by seeing the guard that the guard would let him in to see the king's garden of England. So he went up to the guard, and he said, guard, 
He said, I'd like to get in. Would you please show me around like he was some hot stuff, you know? And he said, would you please show me around the king's garden? And the guard said, no. He said, nobody gets in to see the king's garden. Oh, the little boy was so brokenhearted. He'd heard wonderful things. His mama had spoke about the king's garden. I mean, he thought his mama had visited there. His grandmother had spoken about the king's garden. He thought for certain that grandmother had visited there. And so he said, he said, but you don't understand. He said, I've traveled all this way, and I just want to see the king's garden. Would you let me see the king's garden? And they said, uh, the guard said, no, you cannot enter in. Oh, he started to cry and uh, started to walk away, and the prince was staring out one of the gates. He saw this little 12-year-old boy, just so heartbroken. And so he walked out around, and he came up alongside him on the sidewalk, and he said, why are you crying? He said, I came all this way just to see the king's garden, and I cannot get in. And the prince said, follow me, I'll get you in. Took him by the hand, walked in around the gate, uh, showed him all the beauty of the king's garden. Finally, took him back out to the guard, and the guard said, uh, how'd you get in there? He pointed to that man. The guard saluted the man who was the prince. He knew who he was, uh, but the boy had no idea who he was. And finally, the guard said to that little boy, do you know who took you in? Well, it was the prince. I mean, that is the son of the king. And, and by the way, only the son of the king could get you past the guard. Now, can I tell you, only Jesus Christ can get you to heaven. You cannot get to heaven any other way. You're not going to be able to see the beauty of heaven. You're not going to be able to walk down the street of gold. You're not going to be able to walk down uh, the street of gold and see uh, that which is the gates of pearl and walk beside the uh, walls of jasper. And you're not going to be able to live in a sinless, uh, perfect place. Can I tell you, it's only because of Jesus Christ today that our nation can come and celebrate such a fabulous day called Easter. Uh, why? Uh, it's not because we're religious and it's not because we're Parkside Baptist Church and it's not because you have a preacher and it's not because you have a Sunday school teacher. Hey, can I submit to you this morning? It's because we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. His name is Jesus Christ. And when you receive Christ as your Savior, hey, He washes away your sin, gives you eternal life. Now you've got a reason to celebrate Easter. Oh, I hope you have that reason yourself in your heart. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.